Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, editor-at-large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential leaders in the battle against the coronavirus. Almost immediately after the genome of the COVID-19 virus was sequenced and published in a way that research institutions, universities, and private pharmaceutical firms could have full access, scientists have sought therapeutics and vaccines to attack the virus and improve survival rates of the ravages of COVID-19. Pfizer, as one of the leading pharmaceutical research engines in the world, has identified a potential vaccine which has showed some promise in the preclinical phase. Because of the urgent need for such a vaccine, the projected delivery has gone from the end of the year to sometime later this summer. And actually, I could say most times these kinds of vaccines take years to develop. Human trials are expected later this month. The hope is that millions of vaccines will be in supply by the end of this year. Officials at Pfizer laud the efforts that are on track now to take just about half the time that the 18-month development to market phase once predicted. Michael Dolston is Chief Scientific Officer and President of Worldwide Research Development and Medical with Pfizer, where his primary focus is small molecule medicines, biotherapeutics, gene therapies, and vaccines. Michael, welcome. It's great to have you here. You and I have ch chatted in the past about the very rich environment of science and brilliant minds and you know, challenges within the pharmaceutical ecosystem. And I'm just wondering right now, just give us the bottom line on what you think uh, that pharmaceutical world can produce in this COVID challenge. Uh, thank you, Steve, for uh, inviting me and uh, Pfizer to share some of our thoughts on this um, unique opportunity to come together in the ecosystem between industry, federal agencies, academia, to take on this uh, vicious virus. You know, it's only been uh, some four months or so since the virus emerged with a new disease that didn't have a name before as it didn't exist. And I must say, it's been a tremendous rally of science and progress to provide hope that uh, what looks like uh, difficult trouble and time can be uh, combated to get back as close as we can to a new normal. And I think right now I'm very encouraged by progress in both vaccines, therapeutic, and look forward to share some of this um, promise and the underlying data with you. Well, I'm interested right now in how the system is changing. I know that you met the president of the United States with some other research scientists and heads of pharmaceutical farms at the beginning of March, and you wrote about this in Forbes. And I think that, you know, you have a normal process, you have, you know, clinical trials, you have, you know, there's just sort of a calendar challenge in dealing with this. But I think I've read that you're optimistic that we're changing that, speeding things up in very historic ways. Yeah, I, I think um, given that we have such a new challenge, it's been an opportunity to explore new, more transparent ways to work together. And I think it's inspired the dialogues we have with the regulatory agency to be more facilitating while at the same time they want to ensure um, that the process incorporates the best advice for safe and effective vaccines or medicines. But I think it's moving to a level where we jointly look at the needs of the patient and as the clock is ticking, time, trying to make months to weeks, weeks to days and days to hours. Hmm. And between companies, we're looking at ways to create a transparent sharing of experiences to learn quicker together. And that has been very stimulating this reset of the system. I know that you have a partnership that you've announced, I think it's called BioNTech on a potential vaccine. I know you've been working on antivirals as well and across you know, different parts of the spectrum, if you will, in dealing with this. Can you, speaking to a lay audience, not a scientific audience, um, give us some idea of the various initiatives that Pfizer has in place now? Yeah, at the onset of uh, this pandemic, our CEO, Albert Bola, defined a five-point plan to stimulate the way we work together in the ecosystem and how Pfizer can contribute and uh, bring forward its capability, experiences, its resources. 
And one part included for us to leverage the two years experience we had with the German biotech company BioNTech in uh, bringing forward a new technology that's more rapid and agile and particularly suitable to address uh, viruses that either emerge fast like the SARS-CoV-2 and also may change unexpectedly. And this is the technology that we then expanded our regional flu partnership into a COVID-19 partnership to advance rapidly. And I'm pleased to say that we announced this morning in a press release that our partnership got approved in Germany for starting clinical trials with its novel mRNA vaccine technology against COVID-19. And we expect them to start shortly and even imminently in Germany. And at the same time, we are um, filing uh, the, the requirement to start similar studies in the US and they will be very much going hand in hand. We, yeah, so that's the story about the vaccine and I'm happy to add more texture also to the antiviral. In, in the article that you wrote in Forbes, you, you shared a historical analogy that I hadn't thought of, which was about penicillin and the British government and the American government, again, at that moment of great need during, you know, before and during World War II, of saying, we needed to bring this on, we needed to scale in ways they hadn't done. And I'm just interested in that analogy. Where does that analogy fit today? And maybe where doesn't it? How is penicillin and what we achieved back then different than what we are trying to do today? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, while crises like this are extremely unfortunate, and, and sad for all the, those that suffer, I, I think sometimes they can, you know, stimulate, catalyze, that we find new ways of overcoming obstacles because of uh, the devastating threat we are facing. And if you look at, uh, you know, many tens of thousands of casualties and uh, close, you know, the, the much larger passing a million of infected people, I, I think it forced us to think outside the box, how we can come together and um, make sure that we learn quick and find new ways to bring vaccine and therapeutic. And I wanted to actually punctuate, uh, you know, a statement by the CDC director Redfield yesterday that while we feel that we have had a, a tremendous hard time the last few months, we need to take that learning and be prepared. It may be a, a similar, who knows, even bigger challenge as the flu seasons this fall will break in maybe September, October. And what if the SARS-CoV-2 virus bounces back which is highly likely it will not be expelled by that time because there is no vaccine. And I think exactly the same kind of um, plan was emerging in our, uh, you know, preparations here that we want to move swiftly against SARS-CoV-2 now, but we can't wait to have a credible and documented with safety and efficacy vaccine no later than October, when we may be hit by multiple vaccines. And that enabled us to rather go backwards to say, if we are to have a vaccine, at least in millions of doses to protect people in the greatest need by October, what needs to happen every week until then? And that's the type of dialogue we've had with the US and German regulators. And I think, you know, this moonshot allow us to, um, find new ways together. And I'm optimistic that even though nobody thought it would be possible and everyone said it will take 12 to 18 months at least, we now have a plan that's about half that time. And I, I think pending, you know, positive outcome in clinical studies, pending productive regulatory dialogue, there is a plan that put with um, a mix of extremely hard work and no harm to have some luck uh, could enable you to have a solution that could uh, expel the virus from 
the public society and bring back uh, the confidence for those in greatest need that they may be protected. And that really right. that's really uh, what we're working with at right. the moment. So Michael, let me ask you a question. So the world's eyes, and particularly Americans' eyes, are going to be on this ecosystem and what is produced. And they're going to be asking some big questions um, when you discover that miracle. And we do have antivirals and a vaccine. And questions that have been plaguing this uh, uh, ecosystem for a while have been uh, accessibility and pricing. And when we get to that point, what are your thoughts on accessibility of this drug to those who need it? And the pricing questions, because you know sometimes there's a debate about, about how open you make this, because this research costs money. This research, there are failures. But then there's a debate about accessibility and pricing. Yeah, I, I think uh, accessibility for all patients in need globally is very important for us. Uh, it's always important for us, but of course, with a pandemic, it puts this at the edge. So uh, while we think there is a way forward to spend at risk before we have clinical data, manufacturing and our new resources to be able to have millions of doses in October, hmm. we have that just to help those that are most uh, vulnerable to the virus, the frontline uh, people of society and those that suffer from other diseases that make them fragile. So we think about bringing our resources uh, together. And I think it, it was a sign of this partnership that we're working with a cutting edge biotech on the technology. But Pfizer's um, experience going all the way to penicillin, penicillin that you started out with mm -hmm. and over many, many decades to master its manufacturing network across the globe and with other partners to be able to think about hundreds of millions and even billions of doses. And I welcome the ecosystem to have more than one vaccine hmm. uh, because we face this global pandemic. But it's really our vision here to step it up from millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions and even billions as we gather the experience and the momentum in this effort. And that's the only way to bring back something that looks at least somewhat like we used to call a normal day. Although I think this pandemic, the biggest in our century for us, will change the world. But hopefully some aspect of what was normal when it comes to uh, social networking, when it comes to be able to go in a grocery, when it comes to be able for patients to go to an emergency room, when it comes to how an intensive care unit looks like, that feeling of somewhat a touch of normal can only be brought back by the vaccine. Mm -hmm. The beauty can help us to not feel that when we enter into an emergency setting, the risk of fatal outcome is dramatic. But mm -hmm. rather, that we see there are numerous opportunities for physicians and nurses to bring um, back health to us. And that's why those two tools are so important to move hand in hand together. Mm. And we engage in both of them together with many different partners in the ecosystem. Michael, in our last minute or so, I'm interested in your insights. You've been in this for a long time on illusions that we should be careful of. Now, I don't know if they're illusions, but, but this week we saw an NIH uh, report that the hydroxychloroquine study with mixing uh, azithromycin uh, has not panned out, that it did not have a, a demonstrable effect on those patients. Um, we also have a debate going on this in this country about uh, reopening and how we reopen. And there's a tug of war between those who want to look at the economic life of the nation and then others that are looking at the health of citizens. And so I'm interested in the illusions and blind spots that you can tell in this last minute that we ought to be cautious of. Yeah, I, I, I think to um, really change uh, the threat to public health, it, it's only vaccines and therapeutics that in the end can do that. But, uh, you know, as we think about the threat and how we spend our life between that moment and now, um, it's always important to retain hope that we will be able to change this current 
very difficult times, that science will win. That's important to keep that hope, but to navigate cautiously. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the balance between not having a collapsing business and unemployment versus ensuring that we don't lose tens of thousands of lives, it's a delicate path. And I just encourage that there is a broad participation of all the necessary voices to make those difficult decisions. And, you know, when I was at the White House, I, I was really encouraged that we were, you know, some 20 di different experts around the table. And that's my only advice to continue inclusiveness in views and make sure that all the aspects of science, societal um, sciences and, and the business aspect of keeping society going is with the equal balance put in the final decision. And I do think it's important to think about today and move cautiously. I think rapid changes from work at home to suddenly see people at restaurants and shops uh, in kind of the historical way that life was pursued, that would not be a good way. But there may be midpoint where you can keep social distancing, where you can keep careful opening up of certain sectors in certain regions while monitoring through testing the trend and being willing to say, we are moving cautiously and constantly incorporating scientific, medical and other social sciences into navigating through this crisis while the solution of a vaccine is the only way to get to a world where we can come back more to normal life. And therapeutic is what the physicians and patients need at the hospital. So while this right. wasn't a perfect one guiding principle, I think it reflects that forces move and constantly taking feedback from the environment and progress in science. Our mm -hmm. contribution here is to accelerate the science and continue to give promise that in October we'll start to have one or several vaccines that could um, right. be part of the changing society. And I hope at the same time point, or even earlier, therapeutic will help those in the greatest right. need. So, Steve, I hope that gave you a bit of a sense no, of urgency been... and there is progress. Well, I wish you well, and I wish your pharmaceutical siblings well in finding that vaccine, finding those antivirals. It's so important. I want to thank Michael Dolston, the chief scientific officer of Pfizer, for joining us today and sharing uh, this, this important slice of this, of this, of this era. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Hope to see you tomorrow. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well.